Thank you very much. <coughs> I, I guess I'm on. Um, so anyway, here's our hero, uh, Anthony Dvorak. I'm going to present uh, some pictures, uh, play some music. I'm going to try to put together a couple of different stories about the new world. And I, I have to say that even though I hope some of this is new to you, um, this isn't, doesn't really represent new research that I've done, but an attempt to pull things together. But what is new and, and what is different is the fact that I'm going to try to convince you that as great as Dvorak was and as great a work as the New World Symphony is, that it didn't come about simply because a composer came up with an idea and executed it. Uh, it, it came out, I hope to convince you, that Dvorak was really part of a larger network of individuals who had and shared some kind of a joint vision. And it was their interaction rather than the effort of a single figure that produced this. So I will try to introduce these characters to you bit by bit, uh, and also by way of what I call some of the backstories uh, of the New World Symphony that are, are not so well known. So again, here's Dvorak. This was a, a picture that he had when he was in the States. Uh, it's signed, and I'll talk about it being signed afterwards. But of course, it's, it's quite well known that Dvorak uh, came to this country in 1892. Uh, in many ways, he was quite at the top of his game. He was, uh, of course, uh, had heroic stature in, in his native land, although not without controversies. Uh, the closer we get to the real time, the more controversies we find. But uh, he was, a, he was a, a, you know, a person of enormous stature. Uh, he was well known in, in German musical circles, especially due to the efforts of another network of people. Uh, that is uh, the Viennese uh, mafia of, of Brahms and Hanslick uh, and, and Joachim. Uh, these uh, Viennese and, and Germans who had found Dvorak's work extraordinary and had made uh, great attempts to help his career. Uh, and then he had become a star in England uh, in the 1880s. So he was coming to the United States as something special. But he s didn't come because he woke up one day and decided to come to the United States. He came because of this woman. Uh, this woman is an absolutely extraordinary figure in American history. Um, everything they say about um, you know, the status of women can be borne out by the fact that there's not a single book about her. And she was one of the most extraordinary figures in the history of American music. Uh, it was her vision to create the National Conservatory, which stood at 17th Street. Uh, this was, again, a conservatory that had three main aims. Uh, first aim was to make sure that Americans no longer needed to go abroad to get their final musical training. They didn't have to go to fin musical finishing school in Europe. The idea was there would be enough talent on the faculty so the people could stay home. Second thing, and this is a, a part of the brave vision that she involved Dvorak in, was that she actually felt that America could not be America unless it lived up to its responsibilities that were in places like the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. That you could not have an America that disenfranchised most of the population. And she wanted to have a school that welcomed African Americans and women, the handicapped, people from all backgrounds, the poor. Anyone was welcome in the National Conservatory uh, if, if they had the talent. And this was to be a statement. And of course, she wanted Dvorak there as a symbol for that. But what she really wanted him for uh, it was to create a music that sounded American somehow, or to figure out what it meant for music to sound American. In the same way that people conventionally thought, this sounds Russian, this sounds Czech, this sounds Hungarian, she wanted to jumpstart a school of American music. And again, she thought that there could be no one better to do this than Dvorak. So she wooed him. Uh, she flattered him. She paid him an enormously high salary. Uh, and he came. 
because of her, because of her charm, because of her vision, and because of her money. Um, so she's the sort of the, the real second prime mover in this. The third is um, Josef Kovacic. Now, he was uh, a violist. He met Dvorak in Prague. He was an American-born Czech uh, f from the Midwest. And although it, he wasn't really part of this central vision I'm talking about, it's important to keep in mind that we would know very little about his time were it not for Kovarczyk's memoirs. I mean, Dvorak wrote letters, it's true. But he supplies a lot of the backstory for what was going on. He was Dvorak's secretary. Uh, Dvorak didn't do things without him. He was with the family an enormous amount. And his sort of uh, letters that he wrote to Dvorak's biographer, Adekar Shorek, we believe, based on a diary which has tantalizingly not turned up, give us a lot of the details about this. So let's, let's begin this part of the story. And this is a, a, a they're all, any time uh, an academic speaks about something, uh, particularly if they're meaning to be scientific, you should best understand it as a kind of fable. Um, so uh, once upon a time, on a December morning, let's say December 8th, 1892, there was a knock at the door at Dvorak's house on 17th Street. And um, along came somebody bringing an article. The article was called Negro Music. Uh, and we'll talk about it in a moment. It was from a journal. And the person who brought it was this man. You can probably tell just by looking that we're not dealing with a modest individual. <laughs> This is James Hunnaker. At this time, when this picture was taken, he had two primary roles. He was teaching piano at the National Conservatory, and he was writing uh, music criticism at a, at a high level for the musical Courier and other publications. Uh, later, he would become a real big shot. Uh, in, in the 1920s and 30s, along with H.L. Mencken, Hunnaker far transcended the world of, of music criticism and became one of America's most famous and noteworthy public intellectuals, where his combination of wit, uh, snobbery, and extraordinary erudition, and what we today would call interdisciplinarity, uh, which we think we invented, but they knew then, uh, made him uh, a, a really uh, formidable figure. But at this time, he's at the beginning of his career. And um, he plays an odd role in this story. According to his own memoirs, he sort of had a crush on Jeanette Thurber. It seems as if. Almost everybody had a crush on Jeanette Thurber. And, and she was certainly not above using her good looks to get people to do things for her. So Hunnaker wasn't quite on board with this vision of American music that I'm going to talk about. But still, probably at the behest of Mrs. Thurber, you'll keep in mind that most of what happened in the past we don't know at all. So don't be fooled by the few bits and pieces we have to think that I'm putting together the full mosaic. There are little bits and pieces. But I would think that Thurber put Hunnaker up to bringing Dvorak this article, which was published in December uh, of 1892. And again, let's look at what it says. It's a little bit fuzzy. but. To one who has passed his childhood in the South, no music in the world is so tenderly pathetic, so terribly, uncouthly melancholy, so wildly uncouthly melancholy, so fraught with an overpowering heimweh as that of the Negroes. And so it's written in this poetic style, uh, at, the, at least at first, and we get a tune. This fable that I'm presenting, it's my view that Dvorak was hooked at the first tune. You know, he probably heard something like <laughs> and 
and uh, I'm sure he, it, it caught his attention. Um, so the, the next bit uh, speaks about the technical aspects of black music. Um, genuine Negro music, and the word genuine, you know, again, like so much early ethnography and even today, uh, really f loves the idea of authenticity. You know, just when people go into a Mexican restaurant and they say to their friend, this is the real stuff, right? So everyone's always looking for the real stuff. And so she, the writer says, genuine Negro music is invariably in a peculiar minor, which differs from the civilized scale in two particulars. The sixth note of the gamut is omitted, and the seventh is half a tone lower. So instead of. And, and referring to this, uh, these five note scales. Uh, and also referring to rhythm, a certain syncopation represented by a dot eighth and a dotted quarter. So this ba 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 ba, which you hear, ba 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 ba. That, that known as the Scotch snap. So right here on page two, in the beginning of December 1892, Dvorak is getting a cookbook, a little recipe book for how he might think about making American music. Well, uh, this is, and, he, and of course we have tunes here, uh, and we'll, we'll come back to this tune later, but it's not that. So the first page is all sort of pathos and poetry about black music. Second page, highly technical. This is what it is. You know, this note's missing, it's the Phrygian mode. The third page is the kicker. When our American musical messiah sees fit to be born, he will then find ready to his hand a mass of lyrical and dramatic themes with which to construct the distinctively American music. So my view is Dvorak read page one, said, ha, ah, how beautiful. Page two and said, hmm, technique. Page three, really hooked, the messiah of American music. Um, so do we know that Dvorak read this? How do we know that just because Honecker brought it, Dvorak read it? Well. I don't know. We don't really, but um, this is uh, the handwriting of Dvorak's son upside down in the margin saying, I love you, daddy. Um, so I, I, you know, again, in this fable, which could be true, um, Dvorak's sitting there reading at the table, and his son is writing upside down in the margin. Uh, he might, maybe he's saying, daddy, pay attention to me, but he's writing, uh, I love you, daddy, uh, as, as Dvorak reads this article on that cold December morning. So. Um, you may notice at the bottom that the article is signed by Johann Tanzor, uh, Louisville, Kentucky. It may occur to you, if you've had a good deal of experience in Kentucky, that Johann Tanzor is not likely a name that you associate with Kentucky, although it's certainly not impossible to have a Johann Tanzor there. Uh, and when I first found this, I actually spent a lot of time with the article working on it. And then like a month or two later, I thought, I better find out who this Johann Tanzor is. So I you know, called down to the Filson Historical Society, then known as the Filson Club, the Historical Society of Louisville. And I said, could you find out uh, who Johann Tanzor was? And the guy never got back to me. So I, said, I wrote him. I said, well, what's going on? How come you haven't gotten back to me? He goes, I'm still looking. Looked for a while longer. And he said, you know, there's no Johann Tanzor. So you know, in the old days when you used to call directory assistants, if they wouldn't give you the number in Fairview, you'd say, can you look in the surrounding towns? So I said, can you look in the surrounding towns? And he goes, no, you don't understand. I've done a state search. There's no Johann Tanzor anywhere in Kentucky between 1840 and 1920. So obviously, it was a pseudonym. But the question is, a pseudonym for whom? So that took, it took a while to track this down to find out who would have known that kind of thing, who was writing about that. And it turned out that it was this wonderful woman, uh, obviously using a German name so that she could publish in a journal, because under her own name, 
uh, like most women, she would not have been allowed to publish in a journal, or at least seriously discouraged from doing so. And I'll talk about an occasion where women did have an opportunity to publish, but in an odd and, and somewhat limited way. So Mildred Hill was uh, born in 1859. She was an important ethnographer. She wrote the first history of Louisville, uh, music history of Louisville. And she was a composer as well. And we'll get to her compositions later. But she wrote songs. She was a local music teacher uh, and, and a, an important local personality. So again, uh, just to keep in mind, this is the first tune that I played. Um, those things that we spoke about, the lowered seventh instead of and this kind of pentatonic kinds of five note scales. Um, and also this scotch snap, bum, bum, ba, 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 that kind of thing. Um, we also might note that here, that sort of, so a little bit of the Dvorak quintet in E flat, this seems to be sort of taken from this. So let's keep this in mind, this little G minor piece that Mildred Hill puts in it. And these are the first sketches for the, uh, that well, really not specifically for the New World, but the first set of sketches that eventually lead to specific sketches for the New World. Um, I don't think it's a coincidence they're also in G minor. I think he's sort of trying out a little bit of that style. Um, uh, Jarmo Berghauser, on the basis of some information supplied by Kovacic, Dvorak's secretary, uh, believed that this was uh, eventually a sketch for a new national anthem. Dvorak didn't particularly like either God Save the King or My Country, Tis of Thee, in its tune or the Star Spangled Banner. Uh, and um, as Berghauser, uh, another a great uh, Dvorak scholar, um, sort of put it together, this was to be uh, the, the, the national anthem. So I, I mean, it's a little bit of an odd setup, and I'm not a singer, but let's see. Well. That was to be Dvorak's sort of a new anthem. Uh, and of course, we know that it, it didn't end up as a new anthem. But we know that it ended up as the theme, uh, it, one of the most beautiful pieces, I think, ever written by anybody. Uh, one of the reasons that I'm standing here before you is because of Dvorak's quintet in E-flat, which I heard um, first in, I think, 1968, when I was lying in bed after ruining my knee playing basketball and I had to have an operation. And I heard this piece, the second movement of this. So this is the, the theme that it eventually became. First line. And here. It's a little different. Then it repeats. Switches to a major key. So 
So this theme, uh, which he sketches on this December morning uh, uh, on the, the 19th, uh, eventually becomes this wonderful theme. And I, and I think it was yet another way of inscribing America into his compositions. Well, not too long after, we have this, which is the first page of the manuscript of the New World Symphony. And, and I, I think it is, it's, you know, you, that's, the reason I refer to it as a fable is you, you can try to prove anything, and it, it's very difficult to do so. But this opening of the New World Symphony, this dee-da-da-da, this dee-da-da-da, is, is really quite close to da-da-da-da. So that G minor sketch that he begins on the 19th of December, I think finds its way into the opening of the symphony. And I do think it was on the heels of having received this article, Negro Music, from Johann Tanzor, that actually started him thinking in this direction uh, of, of a possible way to make American music. Now, this was not the only uh, force that was acting on Dvorak. And, and it's very difficult to get the timetable straight. So this is my theory. Um, as I'm sure you figured out, even this morning is an infinite distance away from now. And remembering what we did this morning uh, is somewhat of an effort. So trying to remember what somebody like Dvorak did uh, more than 100 years ago is a stretch. But um, th the article was published at the beginning of December. Dvorak did begin sketching and dating this stuff on the 19th, so I think that works. There's another figure who comes in sometime, but we don't know exactly where. And he's an extraordinary figure as well. So again, keep in mind, my idea is it's an extraordinary work, not only because Dvorak was an extraordinary composer, but because in this time and place, there was an extraordinary group of individuals who were willy-nilly collaborating on this project. And this was one of the great ones. Um, we had a whole discussion uh, in one of my classes recently on the whole question of appropriation. And one of the things was, was a lecture about Africa and African music. And the person speaking said, you know, um, people like Beyonce, uh, you know, singers, feel as if they can sort of take African rhythms and Africa, that, that somehow it all belongs to the collective. It's not covered by copyright. So one composer can't steal from another composer, but you can steal wholesale from. So Harry Burley sort of represented um, <laughs> you know, a hundred years of African-American song, which in effect, he gave to Dvorak for free. <laughs> Although um, it may be what's called the gift economy, because we'll see that Dvorak gave things back to him as well. But Burley was an extraordinary person, uh, the grandson of a slave, uh, originally from Erie, Pennsylvania. He was highly educated, a wonderful musician, a great singer, both worked for Dvorak and was taught by him. Uh, and we know from Burley's records, but also from the records of others, that he was called in at some point, December, January, February, during the composition of the New World Symphony to somehow authenticate black music. Because Dvorak had the notes in this article, but he didn't know how it was supposed to go. Uh, and so Burley was supposed to supply that. Now, Alas, we don't really know what Burley sounded like at this time. Burley hated recording. Uh, and he, so he made almost no recordings. But there is this recording uh, from when Burley was in his late 60s of singing one of the songs that, that Dvorak, uh, according to Burley, loved the most, which is Go Down Moses. And this is what Burley's voice sounded like, again, when he was in his late 60s.
So if that's Burley in his late 60s, you know, imagine what it's like in 1892 and 3 to, to hear this. So I, I, I'm just saying, no Burley, no New World Symphony. Period. You know, I mean, this was an important, important source for Dvorak, both in terms of the energy, but also in getting his handle, getting his head around what black music was if he was going to make that as he tried to the core of something American. Uh, Burley also looked after another person. I just wanted to show this letter because I like it. Um, uh, this is the Lakota, oh, the nice, remember letterhead? Uh, you, you know, you have your email letterhead, I don't think so. Uh, and it says, as you can see, absolutely fireproof. I'm sure it burned down shortly after that. But this is a letter from Burley uh, uh, to Dvorak, uh, dear doctor. Uh, by the way, Dvorak got an honorary doctorate at Cambridge, and that's why it's dear doctor. And, and it's my favorite Dvorak story because um, Somebody asked Dvorak, what, what was it like getting your honorary doctorate at Cambridge? And he said, oh, God, it was awful. I had to listen to these endless speeches in Latin. And I felt so ashamed of myself. And then I thought, you know, maybe it's better to compose a stabat mater than it is to know Latin. Uh, but at, at any rate, uh, this is a letter sort of um, introducing Will Marion Cook, who, who uh, Maurice Paris spoke about. Will Marion Cook, the only teacher Duke <laughs> Ellington acknowledged having. Uh, and, Elling and so this was, please take Will Marion Cook, a former pupil of the great Joachim. So this is the sort of Viennese mafia once again, Joachim, Brahms, introducing another African-American musical star who wrote what is arguably the first musical in the United States, for, which is called Indahomey. And, and, and Will Marion Cook also became a, uh, a, a pupil of Dvorak. Now, on the one hand, we have Mildred Hill, Johann Tansor, and Harry Burley representing some concept of authentic black song that can either be traced directly to slavery or can be traced to the wilds of Kentucky following the notion that the further away from supposed civilization a song is found, the more pure and untainted it must be. So M Mildred Hill had gone collecting. Um, but there was another kind of music that interested Dvorak as well. And I don't think we should forget about it, even though it's not so politically correct. Uh, and some of us know even more about this. So this is minstrel songs. Uh, and uh, min this was an Oliver Ditson publication. You can see the kind of racist banjo playing black man in the boat. Uh, and and then, you know, happy who knows what in the corner. Um, you can't imagine that they're putting things out like this, but uh, people were probably not doing close readings at this point. It was supposed to represent an idyllic time, uh, albeit a grossly false idyllic, but not the first one of those. Um, and this is uh, the first page, old folks at home. You can see it has one of those Dvorak Museum stamps. Uh, that we're all so fond of. And at the bottom, um, there's a note, which I'll go into in a second, but this was Old Folks at Home, the famous song by Foster. And uh, it, Dvorak famously made an arrangement of it in uh, 1894 for the Herald Free Clothing Drive with an all-black chorus and orchestra. So this is, uh, again, a kind of music that also captivated Dvorak and that he used. We know that uh, this is a note from Kovarjik that says this is the, the, the maestro's minstrel songs, which he used while he was here and which he left. Uh, and so this is inscribed. Now it's back in, in, uh, in, in Prague. Uh, so again, a comment by Kovarjik. And then we see that Dvorak has marked So these kind of dotted rhythms, uh, which I think uh, become rather famous in the humoresque, the bump ba dum ba dum ba da da. You know, Dvorak marks that. Um, and then, as many have noted, um, 
old folks at home and the humoresque um, share the same kind of harmonic structure, you could almost argue uh, that, that the humoresque is a kind of deconstruction of old folks at home. Um, and here are some, you know, da, 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 bum, bum, ba, da, da. So, and this Swanee River and humorous da 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 bum ba da. So you know he's sort of borrowing and turning around these these elements um, uh, throughout. So we have again this idea of authentic black song and also minstrel songs that that go into the mix. There's another figure who was extremely important uh, for Dvorak's time. This was one of the leading music critics at the time, Henry Crabill. Henry Crabill, perhaps even more than Jeanette Thurber, was a true believer in the idea of black music being critically important to the future of America. Um, again, one of the things that happened, when, when whites first heard slaves singing, there were a lot of notations that really refer to it as noise. It was not regarded as music. It was not even regarded as primitive music. It was just noise. And then maybe it was primitive music. But as the century progressed, under the influence of a lot of different kinds of political thinking, there was something that, that a colleague of mine calls ethnosympathy, uh, which is under the influence of these political ideas, people began ceding to black music not only the capacity for expression, but stronger and stronger capacity for expression. Until by the 1890s, there were many who believed that because of the history of slavery, this was by far the most expressive music in the United States. And those were the people surrounding Dvorak, including Jeanette Thurber, but especially Henry Crabill. Uh, and that was one of his specialties. Um, Krabio got close to Dvorak. We know this because in the, in the Dvorak Museum, there are, are some letters that show that Krabio visited Dvorak right before the premiere of The New World, and that Dvorak made specific notes which have vanished. But Krabio says, thank you, Dr. Dvorak, for making those notes on the symphony out of which I wrote my article. We've never found Krabiel's notes. Krabiel's nachlas, his, his, we've never found it, but it might be there someday. And Dvorak made notes for him. They were that close, and they had a, had a real friendship. Um, and I want to use that, those notes and the article based on them to switch to another level uh, of the New World Symphony. So this is Dvorak in the New York Herald. Now, it's kind of interesting. As anyone who studied Dvorak knows, he was not a blabbermouth. He was quite reticent. Uh, he didn't really want to give up the secrets of his magical musician's workshop. And why would you? Um, but he was uh, not among amateurs in the United States. So this is often called the golden age of journalism, or perhaps more accurately, <laughs> the golden age of yellow journalism where many people, for the first time, were thinking that it was not the job of reporters to report the news. It was the job of reporters to make the news. And Dvorak was about the biggest fish around. So on this one day, December 15th, 1893, <clears throat> we have more information from Dvorak about the New World Symphony than we're going to get in all the other times put together. He talks to probably Stein, Alfred Steinberg. Uh, these are unsigned uh, in the New York Herald. And he's talking about the, the famous Largo, which uh, is an adagio <clears throat> in this. Oh, let me, let me put a nice parenthesis here, because it's another one of my favorite stories. So when we talk about a network of people who create a, an artwork, um, the conductor for the New World Symphony was Anton Zeidel a famous Wagnerian, a disciple of Wagner, and a wonderful conductor. <clears throat> and Dvorak originally marked the tempo of the Largo uh, andante. So I don't know. Something. And then Zeidel said, let's, let's slow it down. So you can see on the score, andante is crossed out, and then larghetto, so you know. 
but no, no, Zyga wanted it slower. So you see Larghetto crossed out. You can see it on some of the parts that were available that were being shown by the New York Phil. And then Largo comes in, so. So I submit no Burley, no New World Symphony. No Zyga, if it's an Andante, I don't know. I mean, it, it be, you know, the, at that Largo speed, uh, it becomes a, a really important work. And I'm sure that Zeidel explained to Dvorak, which Dvorak, I guess, knew, that there's a corollary in Western music between slowness and expression, slowness and memory, slowness and imagination. And so that's the, it, 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 so even here we see the second movement's an adagio. Well, no, it ain't. It's a largo. OK, but it's different from the So Dvorak says, it's different from the classic works in this form. It's a reality, a study or a sketch for a longer work, cantata or an opera, uh, which will be based on Longfellow's Song of Hiawatha. I've thought about that a lot. And what does he say to Cray Beale in, in this separate interview? We are stopped from seeing foreigns that are native and thrown wholly upon a study of the spirit. It's Dr. Dvorak's proclamation of the mood which he found in the story of Hiawatha's wooing. So in addition to the notion of black music being an integral part of whatever is to be American, Dvorak also wants to inscribe Indian music, Native American music, via the song of Hiawatha. Now, <clears throat> I wasn't going to do this. I've done it before. Uh, it's a, a parlor trick. Um, but I hope you'll indulge me, because this is the part of the score uh, to which the, the, the manuscript is open up, upstairs. So when you go upstairs and look in the manuscript, you'll see the beginning of the scherzo. And the beginning of the scherzo is one of those places that Dvorak firmly identified himself as being based on the Song of Hiawatha. Particularly, he said, it's based on the place where the Indians dance. Well, you don't have to be a gifted researcher. Uh, you just go through the Song of Hiawatha. There's only one place where the Indians dance, and that's Hiawatha's wedding feast. So I thought what I would do is to reprise uh, something I've done at the, at the melodrama, which is to, to do a kind of reading um, of how I think the text goes with this. <clears throat> now, um, just note that you know, to the sounds of flutes, you'll hear the drums. And then first, so we have a solemn measure, more swiftly and still swifter. Um, you hear a little of them of Smetna's Moldau, Voldhava, um, you know, in, in the middle, doodle, 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 doodle. but instead of being a river, it's, it's I think, the whirling, spinning around in circles, and then leaping all the guests assembled, stamped upon the sand. Um, there were three events that happen at Hiawatha's wedding feast. The first is a dance by Paupokiwis. Paupokiwis is like the bad guy. Hiawatha's the statesman responsible. Um, you know, he's uh, like the motorcycle gang guy and uh, played by Marlon Brando or something like that. Papa Kiwis is trouble. He's a troublemaker. But here he's performing as a, as a gifted actor and dancer. The second wedding event is sung by Chibiabos, who is the Orpheus of the Ojibwe, the great singer and bard. He sings, On Away, Awake, Beloved. And um, then there's a third part where there's a magic uh, spell and uh, the, the lodge rises up. But I think I'll just do the first two. I hope the, the balance is right. But <laughs> To the sound of flutes and singing, to the sounds of drums and voices, rose the handsome Pau Puk Kiwis. First he danced a solemn measure, treading softly like a panther. Then more swiftly and still swifter, whirling, spinning round in circles. Leaping o'er the guests assembled, eddying round and round the wigwam, till the leaves went whirling with him, stamped upon the sand and tossed it wildly in the air around him, till the wind became a whirlwind, till the sand was blown and sifted like great snowdrifts o'er the landscape. On away. Awake, beloved, thou the wild flower of the forest. On away, awake, beloved, thou the wild bird of the prairie, 
Thou with eyes so soft and fawn-like, if thou only lookst at me, I am happy. I am happy as the lilies of the prairie when they feel the dew upon them. On away, awake, beloved. So I mean, these you know it, these fit very clearly uh, these kinds of texts. And actually, when Dvorak tries to set that text as part of his Hiawatha opera project, it's very close to that tune. So he was thinking in terms of, of sort of plugging in these texts. Uh, and, and I imagine that since it was, this was the most popular poem in the United States, he might have imagined that his audience had a pretty good chance of plugging that in as well, just as he knew his Czech audience, when he returned home, could plug in the stories of the urban ghoulish ballads that he set uh, as, as uh, tone poems in after 1895. I just want to run through a couple of qu things quickly. Um, Dvorak was planning to write a Hiawatha opera. It's one of the weird stories of his time. He really wanted to do it. I think some of the New World Symphony is sketches for that opera. Uh, these are some of the sketches for the opera that were incomplete. This is a march. And then there's, if you can see the text. On a Right, that's the little aria that he's written here. Uh, on a way awake, beloved. Very close to da 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 da. Right. So these are the sketches, and he kept he kept writing. Where's the libretto? Well, there's this whole weird thing that happened. We don't really know why, but the, the libretto was submitted to a committee that didn't like it. So Dvorak kept making these sketches, saying, "I want the libretto. I got, I got all this stuff right here. It's another another page of uh, the the sketches for Hiawatha. It says birds." And then Zvirje, animals. So he's, you know, da -da -da, he's got little bird songs for Hiawatha, different dances uh, that he's put in here. Here's another page of sketches. Hiawatha is, sort of remembers and searches. Uh, so we have all this Hiawatha stuff here. Um, lovely, lovely ideas that are all the way through here. Um, here's another one all these sort of Hiawatha sketches. We don't know exactly that all of them for Hi are from Hiawatha unless they're labeled. But you know, here's something that sounds like. <laughs> sound familiar? A little like the cello concerto in Scipio. So there's Hiawatha's got his own theme here. So he has all these pages. And they, they can't agree on the libretto. So where do they send for a Hiawatha libretto? The logical place, right? Vienna. And, 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 a, and a German libretto comes back, and they reject that too, and that's it for Hiawatha. But this was another core of his American vision. Uh, and I don't know whether somebody just thought the idea of a Czech composer making a Hiawatha opera would just expose the National Conservatory to ridicule, since people were already making fun of the ponderous rhythms of, of Hiawatha, or whether just there was a misunderstanding. But this was also a very important part of his attempt to inscribe things into the symphony so that it would be American. Um, here's another example. Now, I think we need to take it with a little grain of salt. Uh, but this is from Craville's article. This is it's, it's a, a, a part of the last movement of the New World Symphony. Every musician will say at once that this is a legitimate development by abbreviation, blah, 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 blah. But, um, it's not for us to say, but it looks like a paraphrase of Yankee Doodle. So, and he says that in this interview he had with Dvorak, he said something like, well, Dvorak, well, master, doctor, um, isn't, isn't it? And Dvorak, as according to Krabel, didn't say no. So, so, I mean, that's also possible that, that this was another way of inscribing what is American into this symphony. Now, importantly enough, as I talk about this network, we have Krabiel, who brought him stuff, right? And we have Thurber, 
who gave him stuff, told him to write a Hiawatha opera. And we have Mildred Hill, and he found that stuff, right? But how was the stuff to get out to the rest of the world? James Creelman, one of the first great yellow journalists, one of the only journalists to lead a charge up San Juan Hill uh, because as the flag had been dropped. Um, he was an astonishing figure. He interviewed Tolstoy, Anton Rubinstein, went to Haiti, all over the world. And uh, he liked Dvorak quite a bit. They became, they became friends. And we know a lot about his relationship from a much later article that he wrote uh, on June 21st, 1894, in the Pell-Mell budget, which, is, which was his claim that he had something to do with Dvorak's uh, writing this symphony. And it's impossible to sort it all out. But we know that Dvorak, and this is a photograph, transcribed this. And th he didn't do this very often. Um, to my friend James Creelman. You don't see that very often. So Creelman was a charmer. And this is old folks at home transcribed. And <clears throat> so Creelman had obviously gotten close to Dvorak. Um, it, it's my view, and I think it's accepted by just about everybody now, that it was Creelman who put this together. The real value of Negro Melodies uh, is not an article by Dvorak. It's an interview with Dvorak by this yellow journalist. And he's doing it for a very special purpose. He wants to get this word out. He wants to create controversy. He wants to get some notoriety for both the conservatory and Dvorak and this new symphony. And this is it. This is 1893 saying, I am satisfied that the future music of this country must be found. Can you imagine in 1893 in the United States saying that the future of American music should be based on these melodies? Uh, it was an absolute revelation. Uh, people hated it, especially the people in Boston hated it. The Bostonians uh, just used, uh, who used words like repressive as a positive uh, thing, they said, well, how can you write repressive Anglo-Saxon music, if, if this is your basis. And H.H. And, uh, uh, Beach, Amy Beach, even wrote uh, a Gaelic symphony to sort of, in the same key, to try to argue that the sources for American music should be Anglo-Irish. Um, so anyway, this is, uh, this is Dvorak's manifesto. These are the folk songs of America, and your composers must turn to them. Uh, all of the greatest musicians have borrowed songs from the common people. And um, it was Creelman who took the lead in getting this word out and publicizing Dvorak's new view. Um, so again, um, a lot of these tunes uh, you know, have their echoes. This is the most famous, right? Everybody knows that if you cover up the first uh, me measure of Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, Instead of swing low, sweet chariot, da 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 da. But if you bum 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 ba ba ba, you know that's the famous third theme from from Dvorak's New World Symphony. Uh, even this theme, the second theme. <laughs> that kind of tune, which is that that's the second theme of the first movement of the New World, with, uh, really comes from these lowered. It's in the same key, too. And I don't think it's a coincidence that in, in an E minor symphony, he put these in, in G minor. Uh, G minor, the key of Mildred's songs in B flat and G minor. Um, so I think that's, that's important, that they, they do come from here. Um, here's another. Another thing, and you know, uh, this is the, the um, I guess it's the Largo. I don't know how it got into E flat, but um, da, 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 da. and here's the famous spiritual: steal away, steal away, steal away to Jesus. The same rhythm: ba 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 ba. So he's drawing on these on these spirituals. Either Burley is singing them to him, or he's trans, you know, turning the rhythms upside down. Um, and uh, again, I think this is uh, kind of fascinating. I thought I'd give a little. This is um, I, a tune called I Would Not Live Always. Uh, and Mildred Hill, 
Johann Tanzor says, one of them almost purely African. But th this tune is, I would not live all way, it, it is a white tune that when it's white, it sounds like this. version, it really sounds like. So this version of the tune, based, uh, I guess, originally on that earlier white thing, is different between da da dee da 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 ba da da ba da 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 It's a whole different tune. Uh, and, and Dvorak is also taken and consumed with these tunes. Now, let's keep one thing in mind, because one of the caveats is, well, it, isn't Dvorak doing all this when he's writing in Bohemia before he comes to the United States? And the answer is absolutely yes and no. I mean, he has his tools. He has his technique. You don't invent a new technique at the age of 50. But he recognizes things in American music that are part of Bohemian music, and he accentuates them. So the image I'd use, which is probably the last time I can use it because they're disappearing, is the image of the equalizer, it, like in, in a stereo. That you know, he just, he's pushing the knobs. He's doing a little more of this. And, and, and it doesn't take much to create something which is stylistically different. He felt it was different, and a lot of other people do as well. But it wasn't enough to just have blackness, Native American music, little tunes, Yankee Doodle. Nah, he wanted more to make it American. So one of the great moments in this symphony is the transition back to the famous Largo theme after the middle. And you'll recognize it. Um, it's more Beethoven than America in some ways. Right, right, you know. Right, it's a pastoral symphony uh, with a drone and everything. Um, it's, a, it's a spectacular moment. And again, we have this. He tells Crabiel in the interview that this is the awakening of animal life on the prairie. And since even those of us who are New Yorkers, and even some Midwesterners, um, know that prairie dogs don't trill. So it, it, it's birds, right? That's what you're going to have. That's the awakening animal life. So once again, I thought I'd give you an old picture of Hunnaker, because it was Hunnaker who not only brought Dvorak uh, the article Negro Music, but he brought Dvorak at the same time that December morning a book called Wood Notes Wild. I had had this sort of for a while. I knew about this. But I thought that, you know, because Honecker was a bit of a wag and a wit, that when he was joking when he said he brought Dvorak a book of birdsong. So a about a year or two after I first read it, I was in Prague, and I went to the Dvorak Museum. And I said, you, do, you guys must have a book of birdsong here. And they looked at me as if, you idiot, this is not a, an ornithological museum. Uh, I said, no, look, look. And they came back with it. Um, and of course, uh, the first um, it's uh, our, two, our first two spring visitors. And there's the, the bluebird, hear me, hear me. And um, here's the <laughs> which is the second thing we hear, right? The first thing we hear is the, the oboe. Right? And that, that's the song of the bluebird. Here's a real bluebird. I don't know how. Right? But Dvorak's not using a real bluebird. He's using this notation, right? And then the um, second thing in the book is the song of the robin. And there's a lot of robin songs. But if you look at it, here's right? And here's the robin, sounding more like a robin. So yeah, pa 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 yeah, pa 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 pa. This, 
right? The, uh, ta -ta -ta -ta. So, so he sort of inscribed America further in the symphony by, by using these authentic American birds. Now, it's not a coincidence. Remember, this is still a Hiawatha movement. So it's a coincidence. It's a great coincidence that not only are these the first two birds in this bird song book, but the passage in the wooing. Pleasant was the journey homeward. All the birds sang loud and sweetly. Sang the bluebird, sang the robin. So he's found his birds in the poem. He's found his birds in the book. And he puts his birds in the symphony. Those, of course, aren't the only birds in the New World Symphony. Dvorak, most famous composer bird lover. Um, this is another famous passage where all the sisters and their husbands in this story told at the wedding are turned into birds that hop and twitter. All the sisters and their husbands changed to birds. Some were jays, and they hopped and twittered, right? So that's another bird. And then, of course, at the end of that passage, uh, their tails unfold, and you hear them cooing. So those are the cooing birds, that, that pigeons cooing there. Um, and, and we know we have one more bird in Dvorak, just to sort of give you the idea. The famous passage at the Scherzo of the American Quartet. OK, so it's this passage. Here. According to Kovarjik and others, this was the song of the Scarlet Tanager. So this is what was reported that Dvorak kept saying, that bird's making noise, and he inscribes the bird. Uh, most probably the Scarlet Tanager into this quartet. So, so in his American music, it's, again, not enough to have blackness, not enough to just have Native American stories, not enough to have minstrel songs, not enough to have Beethoven and Schubert. It, it, you have to have some authentic uh, American nature inscribed in. Um, let me close by um, not that short a close, but a reasonable close, by, by showing you this letter. Now, this is a letter from Mildred Hill to Dvorak, 1895. May I address you on a subject that you seem to be much interested, that is street cries. And she tells Dvorak about the street cries that she's collected in Louisville, Kentucky. And these are some of the street cries she sends Dvorak. This is in the Dvorak Museum in Prague, uh, this letter. And these are, these are, get your morning papers, quo, ho, 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 quo. These are coal, um, and all these. Old men dropped down dead of the coal, quo ho ho quo ho ho, cause he couldn't buy no coal, cause he couldn't buy no coal. So these are the songs that, that black vendors would sing. There's a couple of white vendor songs that she throws in only to show how inferior they are. Um, so this is, Negro whistles this. So all these are the, the, the black street cries. Now, Mildred uh, mentions that she's going to publish them, and she does. She publishes them because on March 27th, 1895, the newspaper in Louisville, the Courier Journal, is turned over to women for a benefit uh, in fundraising. It's called the Satin Edition or the Women's Edition. So women do everything. They set type, they write the editorials, they do everything. So all these poor intellectual women in Louisville who are just dying, they all use this as an occasion to publish their scholarly articles. They do a great scholarly dump into this fabulous edition of the newspaper. And Mildred publishes this 2,500 2, word or plus article on street cries um, with all these musical examples, uh, Dr. Dvorak's opinion, uh, and all this. So it's, it's quite an extraordinary thing. So this is, um, this is just a little you know, scholarly nonsense that, to try to just show that the, we don't know 100% that Johann Tanzer is Mildred Hill. 
But when we look at the expressions that Mildred uses in her own publication, it becomes clear. She uses exactly the same language as Johann Tanzor, genuine Negro music, uncouthly melancholy, things like this that just that prove 100% that she is Mildred Hill. So Mildred Hill fits into our story not because of this alone, but because of a remarkable thing she published in 1893, the same year as the New World Symphony. She published a book called Song Stories for the Kindergarten with her sister, Patty Hill. Uh, Song Stories for the for the kindergarten, music composed and arranged by Mildred Hill. Uh, and this is, this is the 18, October 16th, 1893, just shortly before the premiere of the New World Symphony. Uh, and as many of you may know, the first song is none other than, good morning to you, good morning to you, Good morning, dear children. Good morning to you, which you may recognize with another text, uh, although it gets slowed down in the middle. Of course, this is happy birthday to you. Now, in her letter to Dvorak, Mildred Hill says something interesting. She says, I collected these street cries f for my own interest. But now that I'm composing, I use them when I compose. And you can look at the street cries if you look at this, I mean, happy birthday is sort of like a street cry. Uh, it's, it's a very short series, like get your red hots. Uh, and this too. So, so it seems quite likely that, that Mildred assembled Happy Birthday, or Good Morning to All, at least in part out of her black street cries. But she did it for a reason. Uh, it, this was the, a secular liturgy for kindergartners, particularly at a time when there were immigrants coming into Louisville. And so what she wanted was to make sure that she inscribed into the first thing these kids would sing in the morning, Blackness, black music, black America, the music of the lowest of the low had to be part of this experience of connecting children from the home to the world of commerce and the world of adults. Here's what she said. These are, Mildred died in, in 1916, didn't say much about it. But of course, thank God for lawyers, right? Um, there was a huge copyright case about Happy Birthday. And so the, the, there was a deposition in 1935. Her sister, Patty Hill, was still alive. Patty, the first woman full professor at Columbia University, an extraordinary woman who kind of invented the American concept of kindergarten. So we wanted to provide good music for children to adopt their limited ability. We wished the song to express the idea and the motions embodied in the world. We're, but then we, it would be written, and I would take it to the school the next morning and test it with the children. If the register was beyond the children, we went back. So what she's talking about is creating a kind of folk music. It was a collaborative effort with the children. To, to, if the children didn't like it, we changed it. And, and so what I really want to end with um, is this notion that in 1893, this network produced two extraordinary works. One was an absolute miniature, Happy Birthday, uh, that was written by Mildred Hill to be the first song that kindergartners sang in the morning when they got to school. And she inscribed into it black music and black street cries because she believed that nothing without that could lay claim to being American. And at the same time, Dvorak was creating a massive canvas, an epic the opposite of happy birthday, but in a way connected to it, because he too had come to believe that nothing could be American that didn't have the experience of the black people and the experience of the Native Americans and nature inscribed into it. And, and so both of these extraordinary works come about at the same time in many ways for the same reason, because of this extraordinary network. And for me, the most beautiful and also the somewhat of the saddest thing I'll end with, which is Mildred Hill never knew that as Johann Tanzor, it was likely that she had inspired the New World Symphony. And Dvorak never knew 
that this woman who had written to him and sent him the street cries was Johann Tanzor. So it was a little bit like an O. Henry story. They sort of passed, though they had so much in common, they kind of passed like ships in the night. So even as we can note with pleasure, the many times the figures in this story came together, and even with Mildred and, and Antonine, we also have a wonderful sense of what happens when they slip by each other like uh, composers in the night. Thank you very much.